Look, look at the old stuff. Okay. Let's see if this is sharing. Um, I think it may be sharing. There we go. Okay. Um, Let's see if this is sharing. So I'm Julian Tugelius. This is Christoph Sandgren. Hi. We're, hi. We are apparently live. Um, this is the first episode of uh, Artificial Intelligence and Drinks, where we drink drinks and talk about artificial intelligence. So live today, from New York. Live from New York. Live from New York. Jesus, it's very fucking live. First of all, let's get to the important stuff. This is Plantation Pineapple Run, um, which um, I picked up at the discount liquor store. And Christoph needs something to drink. And we're going to mix this with um, Canada Dry um, Diet Ginger Ale. I mean, look, we are AI researchers, not bartenders. Um, cheers. Cheers. Good. Um, so, I've done a lot of artificial intelligence and games. Um, you know, using games for artificial intelligence, using artificial intelligence for games, using games for games, just playing games. I was just retweeting the uh, stream, so... <laughs> <laughs> right, so, so we're into playing games. Um, okay. And the funny thing here is that um, we both have this in common that we play in games. Lots of different games. I mean, he's like plays these serious games that you need to be smart to play. I play like, I don't know, um, Skyrim and stuff like this. The Battle of Polytopia. I play a lot of Battle of Polytopia. Challenge me. I will win. Um, no, I will. Um, so, <laughs> but the other thing we have in common, apart from uh, playing a lot of games and being interested in games, and we're also really, games. really tall, both of us. Yeah, and he looks nothing like me. Nothing. You hear that? Um, so uh, the other thing we have in common, um, apart from these things, is that um, um, we both sort of started in artificial life and biologically inspired computation. So I mean, we both went to the United Kingdom, this very united country where they are keep their own traditions and they they like each other, right? Yeah, yeah, and currently still in the European Union. Right, that's great. And uh, and we studied, uh, you know, we, we we went into this uh, this sort of um, approach to artificial intelligence. We start with very simple physical and biological phenomena, attempt to model them, and attempt to create intelligence from the ground up. So, this is a leading question. Okay, okay. Who's the best AI researcher in the room? <laughs> no, no, okay. <laughs> this is the leading question. Okay, no, but I'm, just, I'm just checking if, if you've got like someone else here. Uh, <laughs> so the leading mm. question is, um, do you think that um, we could learn more from these biologically inspired approaches? Learning things from nature, that seems to be yeah. a fool's errand. I mean, I mean uh, the journal nature. <laughs> no. no, and I mean, um, I mean, I think it's actually an, um, a very good question. Um, but, so, when we're getting back to what I've actually done uh, yeah. when I was younger in my misspent use, uh, before I did actually game research, was yeah. very much focused on the question of what are the principles that are driving life. So less on like you know how to build the most amazing AI to play yeah. chess or something, but more of a question of what actually you know produces intelligent systems, what makes them better at being intelligent, mm -hmm. you know how do they adapt to like you know all the different things in the world, like how does this generality mm -hmm. that a lot of living things have, the adaptability that they have, actually I, I, work. I, I have right? many friends that are somewhat adaptable. Mm, yeah, and uh, yeah, of course I think that um, a lot of these principles, um, if we can better understand them and transport them into AI, mm -hmm. both for games but also for robotics or um, um, non-game applications uh, would be amazing. Yeah. It's just, I think, but one of the big problems here is I think it's also often the harder and less immediately rewarding route. Right. I mean, there's often this idea, and you've seen it in games a lot, right? So, right now we're seeing this um, rise of like modern AI techniques in games, but for a long time, I mean, you've been doing yeah, this much I'm, longer I'm, than I'm, I have. I'm assuming like modern and 
AI. Yeah, yeah, no, but like, let's say, let's say, you know, you've, you've done this thing yeah. like 10 years ago. Yeah. And I remember actually talking to you 10 years ago and... Uh, he has a good memory. <laughs> a lot of a lot of the stuff back then was much more, you know, rule-based systems and yeah. much more, you know, the AI programmers like looked at the game and they tried to kind of, you know, figure out what the AI should do and then they programmed the AI doing that, right? And a lot of like robotics in that yeah. time was like, you know, you figure out how exactly does the robot need to move to put the thing on the car. It's sort of a finely honed craft of like looking at a problem, coming up with rules, and it's like it takes a lot of um, it takes a lot of skill, it takes a lot of experience, and it has very little to do with AI, as I guess both of us sort of. Uh, conceptualize it. Well, but that, that's also, it's tricky. I mean, AI yeah. seems to be this continuously moving goalpost since like yes. forever and every time we figure something out, it stops being AI and just becomes that's what's, that's like what's make this fun. machine yeah. learning or uh, this or that system and then everybody goes like, no, the true AI is just beyond that door over there. Right? Yeah, that's, that's my walking closet. <laughs> if I find true AI in there, I'll... Uh... Yeah. No, and I think I think that's that's a bit of the issue. So yeah. computer games have actually done a lot of stuff. Yeah. I mean, there were some early examples uh, where you know more um, sophisticated isn't the right word, but like more adaptive, slightly crazier, yes. uh, you know, more interesting for research ideas were yes. used in actual games. We're talking then. about uh, talking about um, creatures, black and white. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, things like this. Yeah, no. Um, Trying really hard to come up with examples here because the truth is quite a few, quite a few of these early examples were not very successful. People try their best to come up to sort of you know take early connectionist research, early evolutionary computation research, put it into a game and figure out it didn't necessarily work that well. Or it just wasn't a good game. Yeah, I mean that's uh, that was also often the problem and uh, yeah. So yeah, um, and I think. That has changed. I mean, there's yeah. both. I mean, a lot more um, AI game playing now, but also a lot more like AI research in optimizing games and game testing mm -hmm. and making content for games. Oh, well, totally, totally. I mean, something that's happened with um, artificial intelligence and uh, research and development is that when I went out to conferences. 10, 15 years ago and said that, hey, I got this really cool stuff where we evolve neural networks to drive cars and we can do it competitively and cooperatively and get really cool behaviors. Then people from the games industry would be like, but we don't need that because we already have these rules that um, say how our car should be driving. And they were looking at me like, why are you even bothering about this? And that was very often the attitude of, um, people who call themselves AI programmers in the game industry, which is fine because, I mean, they solve the tasks they were set to solve. Um, <clears throat> but um, in uh, uh, but in recent recent years, recent two, three years or something, we've seen this huge change where people who are not, who don't call themselves AI programmers, but people who are like higher up in various game studios, um, seem to think that oh, all this new cool AI stuff, we've seen that deep learning can do amazing stuff. How can we use this in our games? Um, and uh, uh, that's great for us researchers because someone is finally listening to us. Are you listening? Yeah, but I'm also uh, looking at our five live viewers at the moment. Man. <laughs> Poor and uh, I try to figure out how the, uh, how the chat here works. Yeah, I think they just like, you know, if they want to tell us something, they just respond to a tweet or something. Well, so apparently there's also, there is also like kind of a actual chat associated with this somehow. Yeah. I don't know any of this tech. I mean, I, PhD in computer science, I, look, I, I, I chose the operating system but only had one button on the mouse because um, that's easier. I don't have to keep track of two. Okay, so just, yeah. just, just so if you're out there and if you want to send us a message and know how this technology works. <laughs> please. Uh, but back to your question, Julia. Yes. So we both came in at it, you know, when we got into AI, mm -hmm. um, good old fashioned AI um, was losing its grip, but and statistical AI was the big thing, like support vector machines and everybody, everybody loved that stuff. Um, but the deep learning revolution had not yet happened. So neural networks were still a little bit dirty. 
I mean, they're still a little bit dirty, but back then, that's how people thought about it. Now well, I mean, I, I think it was even a bit worse. I mean, some people thought they just failed, right? Right. I mean, Which, you know, there, there was a time when there was like more hopes for neural networks, and then yeah. people were and like, like mm. "Oh, it doesn't actually do anything." Yeah. And then, and then it came back because they then they can really do things. Came back with a vengeance. Yes, I like vengeance. Um, in theory, um, uh, academic vengeance. I uh, think that uh, when we get into there, we both got into this field where you looked at, for example frogs and you looked at can we simulate how their brain works and then you looked at like principles of evolution what kind of um, um, intelligence has evolved on top of what kind of other intelligence um, can you sort of build something on top of simple flight flight or fright behavior and can you then build uh, navigation or can you then build some kind of self-awareness etc as you sort of stacking these things up into layers. No, absolutely. Um, and, you know, there's a funny story yeah. here. If I would know you any better, I've actually thought you prepared for this interview because yeah. I think what you don't know is that the very first paper I ever wrote yeah. was actually about a hierarchical restructuring of a visual input field. Nice. And I used the hypothetical frog as the example. So I had like this image of a right. pond and like a fly moving yeah. inside this image and was trying to dissemble it and. Uh, using some back then uh, information theoretic measure to kind of right. cluster yeah. the input I mean, streams and but but very much I mean we and we had this like you know we the images that we looked at first, yeah. for example there's a story about cats that grow up in an environment with only horizontal and not vertical stripes and mm -hmm. they put in a different environment and then they fail and then we're wondering can you like replicate this so not mm -hmm. actually like the successful behavior but can you replicate that kind of failure. Mm. With, with an AI to understand where you yeah. know, the things are coming apart. Because a lot of this work in biologically inspired AI was trying, you create a model of a real biological process and then you see if it has the same properties in some way. No, so, but also, yeah, but I, also I, think, I think there's a lot, I mean, so, so one example that always gets brought up is the idea that you, know, you want the system to fail in a more biological, plausible, or just in a more plausible sense, right? Yeah. So you don't want a neural network looking at, let's say, you know, this like, you know, bottle of beer, and it might look at it and go like, ooh, this is a bottle of beer, and the network that fails goes like, oh, this is a bottle of water, or <laughs> it's a brown shoe, maybe, but if it goes like, oh, this is an aircraft carrier, right? And then you go like, hmm. Yeah. That's a very weird way to kind of fail on this. I think I'm gonna actually drink that next. Yeah. Uh, and and so the the other thing is like with with other systems, you also want to kind of figure out, you know, do they work similar to, for example, humans or natural systems, and do they then fail in very similar ways? And uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of cool cool like you know hopes there that you know if you can kind of disentangle that and figure out what exactly it is that, you know, makes us fail, then we might be able to kind of build a similar system. And there's even, I mean, this brings us back to some of our joint research. I mean, um, there's this whole question, hmm? No. No, no. <laughs> no, our, our, um, our uh, joint um, research uh, that, that's, that's next serious AI and uh, we. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I mean, our, our, our um, joint research on, like, um, you know, when we did the deceptive games yeah. for the neural networks. And so there's the whole idea was, um, how do you actually deceive right. a neural network? And uh, the thing is, I mean, you can lie to it, but you don't want to do that, right? I mean, yeah. it's a bit like cheeky, and if you can control the whole environment, it's cheap. But what you do is you want to exploit like an assumption it has. And actually okay. having assumptions is, is a good thing because it makes us better. So like a generalized AI, like I'd see just can't really be deceived. AIXI is Marcus Hutter's theory of general intelligence. Um, uh, and, and any biological system has grown up, has developed to have a lot of assumptions on layer after layer after layer of, this, of, of, um, of, of assumptions. Right. Because I mean, we know from North Reynolds theorem that um, over all possible problems, um, any possible agent is on average equally good. Um, so you need to have. Oh, by the way, sorry for the sound in the background. That's New York City. Yeah. yeah also, but, also sorry for the uh, pontificating and continuous talking. As we drink more, we'll probably get a bit more relaxed. This, is, this, this becomes this becomes a bit more of a it's dialogue. Kind of so back to my point now. Um, yeah, no, but I think um, you're right. So yeah. I think. Um, 
to become better as an AI, you actually have to, you know, model some assumptions about the world and then just trust them, like object permanence, like things yeah. are still there when I'm not looking at them, yeah. or, you know, objects that look similar probably are similar, and then you kind of, you know, you're not looking at your bathroom tiles and go like, hmm, I wonder if that bathroom tile is like completely different, even so it looks similar, because that would just drive you insane and be way too costly uh, cognitively. Mm -hmm. So you do these assumptions, and then suddenly if one of them you know, gets subverted by a game, for example, where one of the bathroom tiles is actually a mimic that attacks mm. you, <laughs> then, um, you know, you die. Yeah. Uh, but the fact that you as an AI, or the, the fact that you as an AI failed there while the stupider AI would, might actually be better off in that specific situation is actually a form of improvement. Yeah. So, so failing in that exactly. way so might actually be kind of helpful. Because and overall, on average, it yeah. works. Any intelligence ever will have to be... Um, any intelligence ever is adapted to some ecological niche. Um, so are we humans, as are frogs, as are snails, as, as are like weird aliens from Serblux 5 or something like this. Um, so um, it's a good thing if we can make the right assumptions, we can build in the right assumptions. It's funny you mentioned your first paper. So my first paper was also about layers and evolution. But not about frogs. No, uh, no, no. I might have mentioned frogs. Um, um, I don't have anything against frogs. Some of my friends are not frogs. Um, uh, Jesus, I need more to drink. Um, so um, my first paper was about... Um, you want? Yes. Christoph is now having a blue moon. Um, it's... <laughs> You can sponsor this show. Your beer could be up here. I'm going to have Las Almas Cabernet de Chile. 2009? Wow, why am I drinking like veteran wines? I get like students that are younger than this. Well, no, I, 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 I don't, I don't. I get students that are twice as old as this. Um, Actually, now I want to use my wine app on the wine, but uh, yeah, I'll let you open it first. Probably. Um, so, uh, so basically, I was looking at Rodney Brooks' assumption architecture for robots. So Rodney Brooks, for those of you who don't know, uh, back in the 1980s, he, um, um, he uh, revolutionized robotics by instead of having the sense plan act architecture um, that sort of tried to reason about and describe the world in a propositional structure and reason about it, they just implemented very simple behavioral layers like Here's like a pursuit layer. Here's an object um, uh, um, uh, avoidance layer. And here's like a layer that has some simple learning to it. So I did that, but I in each layer I evolved the neural networks, so used Darwinian evolution to train a neural network to implement the behavior of that layer. Which was, you know, I was young, I was foolish, um, I drank a lot. Um, uh, I'm no longer as young. Anyway, but this was not a um, amazing idea that no one had thought about before. But it was pretty neat and it worked well. It was my first paper and I was happy. Um, people have cited it. I'm still happy. Um, by the way, well, what did you come up with? Oh, the image recognition failed. <laughs> <laughs> the wonders of modern artificial yeah. intelligence. Peoples, that's convolutional neural networks for you. When you really need them, which is to identify your wine. Let me maybe try a different angle here. Yeah. <laughs> this looks like a totally legit thing to do, right? Um, uh, then they may. Oh, now we got it. Now we got it. So, so is it good, this wine? Well, it's got a 3.9. There's fucking the... cork in it. I can't pour it. But I think that's probably not the fault of the wine. Ah. Yeah, but it's a 3.9, which makes it, you know, place it between good stuff and very rare stuff. Oh, wow. Yeah. It seems like we're missing some gradations there between good stuff and very rare stuff, but yeah. Okay, so 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 the artificial intelligence has decided that I will like this wine. Well, I think it's more a kind of a crowdsourcing app, and the AI is mostly there to help you take pictures of the wine. Oh, oh, so which part is the AI and which part is the crowd? Don't you think that the opinions of the crowd is part of the artificial intelligence? Like, I don't know what to do with this. Well, you could push the cork in, get like a seed from the kitchen, and uh, pour it through that. This is, you know I'm doing this live. I mean, people, <laughs> people, people, people might, 
People might Also, we're taking wine, uh, wine tips here as well now. So if you're online and yeah. you have an opinion on how Julian should uh, deal with Yeah, bottle. and if you think you should just give up and have a can of beer instead, um, um, that's good. Um, because, yeah, this... this, this <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it's like we're just we're just adding to this image of uh, um, academics as entirely impractical. And well, how many how many AI researchers do you need to open a bottle of wine? Yeah, I don't know. Um, two ain't enough. Um, I have memories of when I was in my PhD and we were like you know a number of PhD students trying to barbecue together and it was um, disastrous. I think we had to go to some get some fast food afterwards because you know, we could not do anything edible. Okay, so the mission to open and pour the bottle of wine has failed. Um, this wine cost me like $15. I am now instead opening a pinstripe pills. Okay, so, 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 so both, both, both our, um, cheers. Cheers. I'm still trying to figure out how, you know, life interaction could work here. Yeah, no, no one is saying anything. Should no you maybe go on to the, can you actually click on the actual, um, video? Um. What? Why? Um, if you, there's like, see, there's like six viewers, and if you click on the viewers, like on where it says live six viewers. Isn't that a bit rude to click on the viewers? So go, go up. And if you click there, no, I think not, not there. I don't know. I don't think it's working. Um, you imagine it could show up here as well. Um, <clears throat> I think that if people want to, want to say something, they would simply um, uh, post it on as a reply or something. Anyway, so. Um, what I wanted to say is that this paradigm we have now, when you try to use, for example, deep reinforcement learning to plan to play a game, um, what I want to say that is bullshit. Okay. But in particular, because it carries all those assumptions that you learn a task from nowhere, from nothing, you start from not knowing anything about the world, an uninitialized um, neural network, um, and then you learn this one task in nature, which is like any any kind of other intel, any kind of action that you know of. We have learned over a number of different time scales, and on a very very grand time scale, we have learned neural architecture over billions of years, and not over doing one task, but doing many tasks after each other. And the tasks have changed. We have co-evolved with a, with a task and so on. And we all build on so many, so many generations of evolutionary history. And during each evolutionary history, we, we have had lifetime learning going on to implicitly and indirectly guide evolutionary learning. So trying to start from scratch and just learn to do a task by doing only that task, like almost regardless of which algorithm or method you use, it's just not going to work. I mean, and it's sort of stupid to imagine that it would work. Or like, when I say work, now some of you might be like, but it works. I mean, no, it doesn't really work. It's like, if you need like um, <clears throat> five million episodes to learn to play a game, it doesn't really work. That's not working. That's some kind of idiot, stupid waste of computing cycles. Um, I mean, sure, it gets some results, but you, can learn, you learn something very, 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 very pretty. In real life, um, in, in, in nature, any kind of biological organism that learns to perform a task builds on everything else it has learned in its lifetime and that um, it's um, that has been learned, hard to come up with a subject here, that has been learned in evolutionary time. And I think that's one of the main sort of learnings we can take from biologically inspired artificial intelligence. Well, I mean, it's also, um, I think, um growing community of like AI researchers embrace these ideas often in the label of like an activism or, right. or similar terms, you know, talking about how experiences, the developmental vector of where things yeah. come from is important and that ultimately, you know, these things have to be grounded in some kind of, uh, you know, um, 
thing that has a precarious existence and actually cares. Yeah. Because right. this is the other thing, right? I mean, all this, um, you know, AIs that learn how to play yeah. chess or, or Go, I mean, kind of, you know, don't care. Don't know. It doesn't matter to them. It doesn't want to play and, also. Uh, Yeah, also yeah. it doesn't appreciate it. And, yeah. uh, um, I think that makes, that makes a difference. And... Uh, might be relevant if we want to really talk about like understanding and um, yes. figuring out like you know what what this meaning is about. So how how dear Christoph, mm -hmm. how do we make the AI want to play Go? That's a good question. So um, actually, like um, so, Tom Fruin has written a paper where he call talks about something like second order engineering mm -hmm. and produce this idea of instead of building a system that you then inevitably put some kind of extrinsic goals into mm -hmm. that are just like, you know, heteronomous, like, you know, the opposite of autonomy, heteronomy, like, you know, the kind of external control rather than internal locus of. No, okay, but yeah, good. So heteronomy, the opposite of yeah. autonomy. Yeah. And um, the contrast to this would be maybe to create a system in which it was possible for kind of life or kind of a life-like organism mm -hmm. with autopoiesis to yeah. arise and then kind of, you know, have genuine goal ownership and genuine, you know, want to yeah. continue existing. And so, the question about the so question so is how, really, how do, do we do actually, yeah. yeah, so A, how do you actually build such a system that, you know, gives rise to this? The other question really is do we, do we really want to, right? Mm -hmm. I mean... A lot of this talk is about, I mean, there's like two two things we can discuss here, right? One is about building as that do stuff like, mm -hmm. you know, play Go, heal people, uh, play StarCraft, send us to the moon. You know, a lot of like these are where we have very specific goals and we, you know, design AI. Oh, make games for more fun, right? Right, make games. And the other thing... We, <laughs> AI, AI that plays games. Yeah, good, so good idea, good idea. AI Let's AI talk about the games. games. Yeah. No, yeah, but you know, we could we could build like an AI that you know maybe yeah. produces games. I mean, it's a difficult yeah. question. I hope we're mm -hmm. going to talk about this more later. But um, I think the the big problem is you know do we really want to build AIs or artificial intelligence that are kind of lifelike in the sense that they are actual like you know organisms and that you know do we really want to replicate life and mm -hmm. do we really want to replicate intelligent life with all that it entails or do we just maybe you know, just want to build like, you know, very sophisticated systems that use some of the principles that underpin our intelligence without all the necessary, maybe, ethical baggage and the like. I mean, I love that you're setting this up in a very car careful and considerate way and everything and posing the right ethical questions, but you know, fuck, I want to build systems that are alive. Okay. I also want to build systems that make cool games and, <laughs> <laughs> and play games. Well, okay, so uh, I guess you don't have enough stuff on your plate then. I'm not, I already ate, but you can do it. <laughs> no, but... Uh, By the way, I do have four puns, so please, every time Julian does a pun, feel free to downvote him, if that's possible on this technology, but I don't understand. No, no, tw Twitter doesn't have downvoting. Twitter has like, and like nasty sarcastic replies that's sort of you know how to you know what i actually just realized is also the way this camera is set up i look way smaller than you which is totally uh <laughs> i you set up the camera look look christoph is actually like um, i'm washing my hands a, 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 a smidgen taller than me um so also we don't look alike in any way yeah, um, I mean, they're not related, regardless of no, what uh, Julian Storman he, says. Storman thinks we're brothers. I'm like, you know, I'm gonna... I, I can't fire my doorman. But, um, um, um... Anyway, back to the topic at hand. Yeah. Do you want to create life in an artificial way? Yes. It's not much of a dialogue, is it? Mm. I mean, I don't see why not. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess since uh, I, I'm, I'm happy that you're casting yourself in the role of the uh, science supervillain that goes like, hmm. That's always, you know, people have this idea that, oh no, don't show the sci-fi movies to sci science supervillains. And like, oh, it will drive people away from science. It's like, no, that's what drove me to science. I want, you know, science supervillains are cool. Um, yeah, and once, you, you, may once also, you may also say that science supervillains drives the wrong kind of people to science. 
like me. Maybe I should have stayed in arts, like my family. They're all artists. Maybe I should have stayed there. I should have done crazy stuff instead. Haha, now I am a faculty member with a lab and I, like, you know, do crazy shit. Um, yeah, well, you know, one day maybe there's somebody from the future traveling back in time trying to stop you, so don't be surprised. Right, and this is not you. you no, are, no, I mean, you, I, you are totally not a robot from the future. I'm totally, to he's totally lifelike. He doesn't fit like a robot. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, I, I think it's, uh, I mean, the the idea of building lifelike systems. Once again, I mean, I've done mm. uh, or. I mean, I, I don't, wouldn't really say I've tried this for a few years, but I mean, I've done science that is, you know, interested in, in doing this, and I think there's a lot to be learned from it, but... Uh, I, I, love how you, I love how you sort of had a second-order subjectivity. It's not that you were interested in it, you did science that was interested in it. Well... Sorry. No, I mean, it's, it's, actually, it's actually a good point. I mean, you were talking about movies before, right? And there's often this idea that, you know, you portray like this... So there's one scientist yeah. on a spaceship, and he's an expert on everything from geology to astrophysics to AI to whatnot, right? And then also, in from the external view, you often have like one person that seems to be like you know this driving force on doing all of it. So I think if we ever build like you know some kind of life-like AI, it's not going to be some guy in a basement, or it's not probably even going to be like some professor mm -hmm. in the Harvard basement or something, but probably. It's going to be like a, the result of like a concerted effort of um, you know, a lot of people working together because it's, there's a lot of really difficult problems you have to tackle and yeah. uh, science often works in really, really small increments and sometimes people make big increments but then still, I mean, a lot of the big breakthroughs in science are still like steps towards something, right? My breakthrough paper that made my career start with the words, with the word towards, so yes, yeah. Um, I think so there's actually a lot of journals that now don't allow you to publish papers with the words towards in the yeah, title anymore. Yeah, and that's why I don't publish in those journals. Mm. In my journal, you can publish papers with the word towards in the title. My journal is I to replay transactions and games. I'm the editor in chief. I edit it um, usually when I'm sober. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think you can usually <laughs> sober. <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah, sorry, I did put the uh, quotation marks in the wrong spot. Mm. Um, yeah, no, I think, uh, so, So no, but I, I also think that when you're engaging in a certain scientific activity, like, for example, you know, one of your goals, if I'm misquoting you here, is to build an AI that builds games, right? Right. I want an AI that can play any game you give it and build more games that is interesting for the AI, um, and then in the end, we can have the AI make the games, and play the games, and then we don't have to bother about it. I mean, we're free. We don't have to do okay, anything. So, 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 let's say, so let's say you could genuinely say that like, you know, one of your goals is to yeah. build an AI that builds games. Yeah. But then you're not really doing that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're doing stuff that kind of hopefully leads towards that. Yeah. I mean, if if we if there's one person out there, shout out to my cook here who's actually building like an AI that uh, builds a game. I think he's sleeping at this point, right? I hope he's sleeping. sleeping. Yeah, I mean, it's like four o'clock in Germany right now. You know, he's probably worrying about something and it and it, it wakes up early. Um, no, but I think I think so. You know, but then you're not saying like, okay, let's just you know do this. You know, build an AI that makes all kinds of games. You're saying like, hmm. Let's figure out this little element here, yeah. and let's you know do this switch. And uh, yeah, so 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 scientists, or whatever we are, um, people like us, always like to say that everything proceeds by small, small little steps. Because how else could we justify that the only thing we ever do is like these tiny, tiny steps? Um, and sometimes we have a great vision, but someone else has always had almost the same vision before. However, just because you can explain it sociologically doesn't mean that it's not true. So. I think it's true that science proceeds by these tiny steps almost all the time. I sort of one of my great hobbies is to um, look at some purported huge breakthrough and then um, say that actually this was just a tiny thing, tiny bit. Um, if, you, if someone else would have come along and, and done this like a year or two later, because all the pieces were there anyway, and that's essentially true for everything. That's how science works and engineering and you know whatever kind of research we do. I mean, this is true for um, for AlphaGo, for example. All the pieces were there. Someone put it together and put more compute into it. And if 
big man wouldn't have done it, someone else would have done it. Which is not to take away from um, what um, David Silver and uh, the, the guys did. I mean, they did something that was like way more impressive than any research I've ever done. Um, so it's great. Great job, guys. But all, all, all progress is just really tiny steps on top of other tiny steps. Oopsie. Are you drawing, Christoph? Um, no, not yet. So. Um. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um. Um, so, when I was, I was, I was just, uh, again, checking the uh, social media feed. I still can't make Keep sense in, of uh, the stuff, but who cares, right? Twitter, no one makes sense of Twitter. Twitter is a weird thing that's bad for your health. Um, and so is drinking, but we do it anyway. Not drinking. Um, so, my analogies are really bad today, right? And, and Christoph is like, today? So the original question today. is... Today? Mm. No quotation so, so, marks here. The original question we keep circling back to is the kind of research where you put lots of effort into learning to play a game somehow. We a lot of people engage in this. I engage in this. Facebook AI engages in this. OpenAI engages in this. Um, DeepMind engages a lot in this. Um, throw like actual tens of millions of dollars into this. Tens of millions of dollars could be used for something useful, like what you actually, what's good? Say something that's good, good for the one stuff. Uh, cure cancer. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that wouldn't work. Anyway, but you could do something useful with it. Well, I mean, no, let's, but, let's, but, 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 let's, let's be, I mean, I the, think, I, I don't think we have to be charitable to uh, like um, DeepMind or Google AI, but for example, I, I think DeepMind is now engaging in some kind of um, medical projects where they yeah. want to use similar technology to help people as yeah. predict yeah. illnesses and, um, yeah. Or I think do diagnostics. I'm actually drawing a bit of a blank here. They're doing some medical stuff. I'm terribly uninspired. I'm getting more and more sober as you speak. <laughs> <laughs> medical stuff. Yeah. Um, so it's great. I went to the doctor earlier this week. We took tests. Okay. And they told me I need to lose weight. Um, and I deeply approve of this science, it's just not me. This is probably something an AI could have told you too, but basically comparing two values, right? I mean, it's like, come on, we live in a Western society where the, you know, the majority class prediction, the baseline is, you should lose weight. I mean, the doctor told me something that basically you could, you could make the assumption that this is more than 50% population. Uh, actually, um, another fun biographical story, I actually had have been told by an AI to lose weight. Oh. Yeah, yeah, so, so uh, remember I was visiting friends and they had this, um, back then the Wii had this new extension, the oh, Wii Fit, yeah. and the Wii Fit came with this balance board that you could stand on and do kind of all kind of bodily movements, which was really cool, and also had a build-in scales. Right. So, so at the beginning like when you created your, what? Like a fish. No, like scales to weigh you. Okay. It's a homonym, I think. So, um, when you set up your avatar, the we would weigh you, right? And uh, you had to enter your height, and then it would create like an avatar. And since I'm uh, quite like I, I'm a bit overweight, but I'm also broadly built, so and my BMI is like morbidly obese. So, so the avatar I created was like really fat and out of shape, and it was like, it was going like and then then the, then the personal trainer said something like, hmm, you should probably use some weight. So, so I did have an AI, and and the fact is, yeah. I have the same kind of experience with uh, my doctor too. I mean, yeah. they look at one number and another, and go like, "You're morbidly obese." Yeah. So, so there's that. Um, I think next I will go into the kitchen and fetch something just to demonstrate that I can still move. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, I, yes. But but I think it's a. I mean, that's an interesting that's an interesting story because I mean, we do have these systems now, and they do like kind of you know make this judgment, and now I feel like. Maybe it was, you know, not the best uh, thing to give. And I mean, this is this is a silly case, right? I mean, this is not really impacting my life. But, you know, you do have this AI system that looks at me and goes like, hmm. 
yeah, you make bad life choices. And the same AI system, you know, that tells me to, you know, uh, lose weight and draws me as an overweight <laughs> caricature of myself, uh, might then also, you know, go on and be like, hmm, you really, you know, shouldn't get that mortgage or, uh, or yeah, something. Yeah, right? that's right. I mean, good, good book shout out here. I just recently read oh. um, Weapons of Mass Destruction. Mass Destruction, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've got that actually recommended from one of your PhD students. Chicago. Ooh. Yeah, so it's a good book. Uh, it's basically about, um, I mean, it's more about data science and how it goes wrong, but mm. it's, this is like an, an area that a lot of people already call AI, right? Mm. I mean, is it, you know, if you have a system that uh, tells people what um, criminals are more likely to be recidivists or not um, oh, based wait, on data, is that an AI or is this just a statistical analysis tool? Yeah. And also, yeah, uh, yeah, no, it also has a lot of problems. Particularly, I mean, it kind of codifies a lot of the um, um, often racist or classist or whatnot assumptions into, you know, statistics, which are then not uh, curable anymore. It's like the British have this really great sketch called The Computer Says No, you know, yeah. where like a person and another person and a computer sit around the table and you want a bank loan, and then I think the bank clerk just goes like, very sorry. But the computer says no. Mm. And there's nothing to appeal to, right? No. It's just like, how can you appeal to neural network? Computer says no. Um, not because what you're saying is uninteresting and I don't... Oh, you want to get to go back to the more hardcore No, topics. no, no. I wanted to do self-promotion. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned a book. Weapons of Mass Destruction. Yeah. But you mentioned that I should sign a book. Oh yeah, do you want to do that now? Why don't you talk a bit about your research and I get myself another beer? I don't, I need another beer. Okay, I can get you one from the kitchen too. Right, right. And, and the book I should sign, and a pen, because I mean I have like an Apple pen here. Apple pencil? Whatever, this thing. Um, and it doesn't help. Okay, so Christoph left. Now this is our chance to... Um, that's, that's my bad, I haven't made a bed. Um, <clears throat> a... We, this is our chance to sort of talk, just you and me, without Christoph. So, um, let's actually talk about when I, what, what I mean when I talk about the original question. So I've gone back to the original question a few times. The original question here is, when you do um, um, this kind of research when you learn to play games, shouldn't you actually do it much more in a biological-inspired way where you learn to play something very, very simple originally, where you learn to perform very simple movements, and you build on this by building up a computational architecture and learning over many, many lifetimes, then simulated lifetimes then, um, to play more and more complex games and learning from them until you can play um, the actual games. Now, I'm say, I'm, I realize I'm talking about a original question, but Christoph isn't actually here anymore because he went into the... Um, um, kitchen to, 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 to get here. Anyway, I refocused the conversation on the essentials. Um, and the essentials is returning to the original question. Um, shouldn't we be doing game playing research the biologically inspired way and learning first to, um, to perform very, very simple tasks, you know, navigate, not bump into walls and so on, and learning to play a sequence of games where we start with extremely simple things um, and uh, um, uh, and then gradually move up onto more complex games. Well, I, I agree. I mean, I generally like this bottom-up approach, but it was a twist. I think we twist? should actually, yes, I think we should actually do it, but without any extrinsic rewards. Mm. Because I think I think part of part of figuring this out, if we really want to, you know, go into that kind of you know game-based learning, but Start with very simple stuff. I mean, think about how, like, you know, children play or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things expose so the world. So what I want to do. Like, yeah. Without, you know, without this kind of somebody saying, like, oh, this is the way you win and here's, yeah. like, a point score, but it's this kind of, you know, exploratory behavior of the environment, the self-setting of goals, you know, this idea of mm -hmm. satisfying your curiosity, mm -hmm. you know, creating new affordances, kind of, you know, just mm. playfully kind of, you know, mastering the world around you and acquiring competency. So and what actually, you, can you use that to, yeah. you know, 
figure out these not bumping into wall stuff and things and not, you know, do this for some kind of, you know, because fixed reward like, at the end. Good, you didn't yet. bump into a wall, nice, nice agent. No, I mean, there's this, there's this ID that had comments in the money guy says, hey, by the way, if you want to open this, we could use the Apple Pencil to open this thing. Uh, well, then let me get a C, maybe, and two wine glasses. Jesus, what you see here is an Apple Pencil that's like all covered in red wine. Uh, speak a, amongst yourself. <laughs> what? There's maybe I'm just saying maybe one of the uh, audience members can ask a question while I'm gone. Yeah, sure. You ask a question by commenting in this Twitter post, and we will see it. Um, but no one is doing that. So, <laughs> so there's this idea. Jürgen Schmidhuber, um, the famous machine learning researcher, um, whom I was a postdoc of, um, has this great theory of curiosity, where a curious agent is an agent that strives to um, that strives to improve its learning rate by seeking out environments um, where it can learn better. So intuition behind this is that if you're an agent and you're trying to perform a task and you don't get anywhere, you're not learning much. Or if you're trying to perform a task and it's super simple and you just win it directly, you're also not learning much. You want something where you have the potential to learn to do better. You can get somewhere. Um, also, if you move into a, a, um, an environment where you can't predict anything about what's happening, um, then um, you are not going to learn much. But if you also can predict everything, um, all the consequences of the action in the world, yeah. that's equally bad for learning. So what you look at is, a, in, is the environments where you predict that you can learn to um, predict better. So that's one way of um, implementing artificial curiosity. Um, uh, this actually rhymes very well with theories of child development from Zygotsky, for example, and whatever the French guy was. <laughs> Some wine governor? <laughs> He's brilliant. This you is... didn't actually remove the cork from it. I with, tried! With the apple pen. You hear the sound? That's the sound. <laughs> This is, we, are, this is, we are not going to make it into an Apple commercial. Um, um, and, um, 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 <clears throat> Why is my beer and cork in it? So we are not drinking Chili and Carmen Air wine with only a little bit of cork in it. Um, um, Cheers. I think also the thief uh, solution might not have been ideal. No, few things are ever ideal. So the idea. Also, I also like the fact that you know you're you're hosting this right while I'm getting the drinks. <laughs> uh, you mean it should be the other way? Well, right? never mind. Yeah, um, that's actually nice. Yeah. Um, so the idea I was just talking about the idea of and curiosity, how it fits in with. Um, um, uh, theories of child development, where you move into the proximal zone of development. It also fits in with um, theories in game design, like um, Raf Koster's theory of fun, where you're seeking out, 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 just like Canadian, Scottish, I don't know, um, where you're seeking out, um, you're seeking out the kind of challenges that make you grow. Is this what you mean when you talk about intrinsic motivation? Well, I, mean, I think uh, the idea of growing is part of it, right? Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of them are focused on some form of like learning or model yeah. outreach. So, the idea, I mean, is that, you know, if curiosity is maybe like even a hard baked uh, property of you mm -hmm. as a living being, right? right? Why is it there? And, I mean, one yeah. of the reasons might be that it allows you to experience yeah. new situations and yeah. then learn about them and yeah. then adapt to them. And next time you encounter them, you're better at them. And yeah. Uh, and similarly, I mean, a lot of them are about just getting the right learning rate in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you want things that are novel, but not too novel. So, you know, you might want to read new books, but maybe not start with the one about quantum physics while you're like, you know, before you have read the one start about uh, 
vector mathematics or Actually, something. Actually, don't start with product yeah, it's not leading it anywhere. And then some <laughs> other stuff, I mean, uh, as, as you know, I, I personally uh, work a lot with this idea of empowerment, yeah. which is about, you know, maximizing your influence on the own world around you, which is very closely related to affordances. This or, is empowerment in a mathematical yeah, sense. Yeah. It's nothing to do, maybe something small to do with empowerment at the senses and and also uh, with competence right the idea of like kind of figuring out how things work and then you can use them and that allows you to affect the world more and so which which is also a form of growth I mean a lot of yeah. them a lot of them are uh, tied to this idea of kind of you know um, improving yourself I mean this is actually an interesting point I think a lot of them are non Static in nature, so yeah. they're not just getting you away from this viability boundary where you die and kind of yeah. so there aren't really motivations that say oh, Don't die and then you hoover around just this line where you could die mm -hmm. But they're about getting you further and further away from it. So they're kind of hedging uh, mm -hmm. You know against the inevitable and so the idea is um, To kind of you know uh, find these kind of things and then you know Maybe at the very edge of being, it's just a survival mechanism, but as we grow into civilizations and, you know, get better and better at not dying, mm -hmm. um, these things then also turn into, um, you know, uh, the ability to, you know, develop all kinds of more advanced ideas and, uh, you know, uh, turn into this uh, kind of creativity that you know creates art and literature and all these kind of amazing things. I would actually have like somebody replying to us, uh, mostly about the Periscope videos. It's mm. asynchronous between Twitter and Periscope.tv. I didn't even know we were streaming on that thing. I don't know. I don't, I don't know why it's out of sync. I don't know anything. This is like technology. Um, oh, I hope uh, I hope our viewers have a good experience. Who? Our viewers. I hope they have a good experience. Yeah, I hope they're drunk. Um, um, uh, no, cheers. No, and cheers. One for, for us and, and for our viewers. Um, I mean, this is a, it's perfectly legit to stream this on a breakfast or a lunch or something. Um, I mean, despite contrary opinion, or contrary to contrary opinion, common opinion, received opinion, you can drink for our breakfast. In England, yes. Not, not you. We shouldn't try it in the US. We both did our PhDs in England, and that made a mark. You know, it's like we got out of this with a PhD and a drinking habit. Um, so, um, cheers, says Zed Burnett on the stream. Cheers, cheers, Gary. Ah, oh, thanks. Yeah, it's great. Um, where were we? So what I wanted to, to ask you now, now is that, okay, so we have these mechanisms for um, creating intrinsic motivation and agents. Is this real intrinsic motivation? No. Or is <laughs> um, no. The, the interesting bit is I had this very discussion with uh, Christian mm -hmm. Guggesberger like yeah. about a month ago, right? Yeah. And Christian Guggesberger is about to finish his PhD at uh, Queen Mary, right? Yeah, 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 he is. You can hire him when he finishes. He's good. <laughs> It's very good. So, so, of course, um, what we actually should say is that all these intrinsic motivation mechanisms are just kind of pseudo intrinsic motivation. So they are kind of the principles that serve as intrinsic motivations in actual organisms, and they're mm -hmm. just transplanted mm -hmm. into machines because the grounding, of course, where you know they tie back to like you know this autopoetic self-preservation is mm -hmm. just not there, and the kind of uh, whole kind of experience and the kind of emergence of like uh, you know organisms' properties is just not there. Mm -hmm. So, and obviously, I mean the extrinsic bit is like you know from like some kind of external source you're given a goal. And now, if I tell my agent to be curious by programming it to be curious, I mean, it's, curious. Not, uh, it's not like intrinsically, like this. it doesn't intrinsically, it's curious. I mean, it is very clearly extrinsically curious because Christoph, I ask when you see it. something new, you should be happy. Yeah. And the question is, how do you actually, how, how do you re make it really intrinsically motivated? Do you need to actually make it a biological organism for this to happen? I don't think it has to be necessarily biological, but I think it has to um, 
I mean, once again, I think I agree with uh, with what um, what what Fröse lays out there. I think you have Tom to Fritz. have this. Um, yeah, or uh, Ezekiel Di Paolo, which... Uh, Ezekiel Di Paolo was my master's advisor. <laughs> I published a paper without him on, based on my master's thesis, because, I don't know, I was stupid. Ezekiel, if you see this, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, well, but, well, but I so, uh, so I think, I mean, Ezekiel Di Paolo wrote a lot about adaptation. Yeah. And about adaptation being this idea that... And this is, this is I mean, I've, I've used a lot of the words from it, so maybe let's explain a bit. So this idea that... You know, there is this kind of edge of being, this this boundary where, you know, your dynamical system or whatever you are, kind of, you know, once you move over, you're basically kind of dead mm -hmm. and you cannot come back. And uh, so once you pass this, you're basically done for. I mean, maybe yeah, your catch. body will, like, maybe your body will persist for a time, but, you know, the entropic forces that you're subject to will kind of somehow uh, destroy you. And so, so... Not only can you just not cross this, but any kind of tendency to go towards them has to be translated into a tendency to move away from them. Mm -hmm. Because you, if you arrive at the boundary with like too much, let's say, velocity in that space, you're also done for. Mm -hmm. And so this, I think, is kind of pushed at this idea of adaptation. And, uh, and then uh, there's this related concept of like kind of autopoiesis of how, you know, you have a system that's basically like... A, collection of processes that are all self-reinforcing each other and um, so if you knock out one of them then the whole system fails but all of them are basically there to make sure that all the others kind of stay in place and so you have like this very kind of circular self-maintaining thing that has to constantly act to kind to, of to maintain its integrity yeah so it has this like kind of act to be or acting for yeah. being and uh, I act therefore I am and those two things um, together, I think, are often like put forward as these kind of requirements. Maybe there are actually more, but uh, they are requirements for this. And there's nothing in there that makes means it has to be realized in a biological system. But you know, don't you think that our kids, we have any, and if they become like cognitive scientists or something, we'll still think about like you know. Um, could we ever realize this and realize that, you know, no one has actually made any progress in this since a long time. It seems like what you're saying, and I recognize this from the folly of my youth and my master's degree, it's beautiful, but could we ever do this? Is this implementable? Um, I, think it's, I, I think it's definitely difficult. I don't see why any kind of, um, well, there's any kind of, so it's definitely not impossible because nature does it, right? Right. So, so of course. But is implement is is it? It's like this: is it implementable without going all the way around? Like, hey, let's invent biological cells. Or like, we don't call they're not technically biological, but they're like the equivalent, and then building everything up from the from the from the. Yeah, but that's that's. Uh, that, but I think so. That that's actually a very good question. So, do you actually need the same kind of setup, right? I mean, yeah. do you need? Do you need so? Do you need cells? Do you need? Uh, um, we're getting a question here. We'll finish it, but we have a question. Do you do you need like you know? Do you need cells? Do you need um, all of this, or is there some kind of alternative way to you know arrive at these properties? Which is very much what the ALA field is about, right? right? I mean, you might not, you know. So basically, I mean, this is something I, I often put out there. So there's basically like one example for life. Mm -hmm. So while you have all these different kind of forms mm -hmm. of life, I mean, it's very likely that they all spring from one single origin, mm -hmm. one phylogenetic tree, all life is related, and the, you know, the basic principles and building blocks and, and DNA is pretty much, you know, it's yeah. made out of the same stuff. It's kind of one solution that branched out into a few different variants, but there's no kind of, you know, completely separate example of, uh, of life that I uh, that we know, right? Mm. And so a life asks, you know, can we have something that, for example, has autopoiesis or mm. organizational mm. closure, as Tom Fraser calls it, and adaptivity without necessarily, you know, having carbon-based uh, nucleotides yeah. or or any of that like biological underpinning that I'm actually not even that familiar with. It, right? it, it really mirrors the question in philosophy of mind whether um, you can have phenomenal consciousness, not functional consciousness, but phenomenal consciousness, like answer the hard question of consciousness affirmatively in something that is not something very similar to our current balance, your makeup. John Searle, 
would say no. He's like, no, consciousness is a biological property. And um, in, I applaud him for taking a stance, um, because that is at least an answer. Now, I don't think he has anything remotely resembling like an argument for it, but it's a position. Um, now, um, what you're saying is the question is, could you have all organizational closure, autopoiesis, and in the limit things that come out of this, intrinsic motivation and so on, outside of the biological framework we have um, today? I don't have an answer. You don't have an answer. Do we even have a way at arriving at an answer? Is there like, you know, is there a way to say something useful and intelligent about this, or are we like wading into the territory of religion? I, I definitely don't think so. I, I definitely think, um, I mean, I, I don't have an answer right now, but I also don't think this is this is beyond science. I mean, there are some, some ways to cast these questions that become a bit like intractable by mm. science. And it's it's difficult to, you know, when you look at concepts like organizational closure to really kind of nail down what exactly they mean, right? And kind of really, for example, devise a test that allows you to look at a system and yeah. say like, this has this and this doesn't have it. Which, I mean, this is something that also came up with when I was, uh, when I was a bit younger, I was also very interested in the study of replicators, like for genes and mm. for memes and general, like, you know, um, biological systems being these general replicators. And one of these things that I always found really difficult was um, what actually tells a really bad replicator apart from something that just, you know, does not replicate. So, yeah. so because not all replicators work or work all the time. And, yeah. you know, just because you replicate once, I mean, does this already like kind of count or do you have a certain kind of threshold? And, um, and it's very, I think it's difficult to, to really draw this line and say like, okay, so you're now like the sustainable biological systems and often the only way to test for this is kind of the success, right? I mean, yeah. you stick around, uh, there are many of you that you've probably made it, right? Yeah. But a lot of a lot of these questions, a lot of these questions get like get like really, really, really tricky. I mean, this actually gets us a little bit to to that question. So I have That's in right. fact, uh, so the one um, is that your next question? Yeah. So I mean, the question Ma it, it reads: Marco Blank gets an F FEP, something you work. That's the free energy principle. Oh, which the free I, energy principle. I definitely am That's not. That's a mystery. Uh, That's which like... I'm definitely not going to uh, explain while drunk, and I'm the, not even sure I could do it while sober. The, the, the free energy principle is like you know the concept of the Trinity and Catholicism, which mm -hmm. is like you know. It's so like... so Julian, I definitely say you should um, you should definitely invite a Carl Friston on the show. Does he drink? I don't know, actually, um, who um, I think came up with it and popularized it. So for, for those of you out there who don't know, so Carl Friston is an incredibly successful, well-known neuroscientist who mm -hmm. I think is originally a physicist, who then yeah. moved into fMRI studies. It's, it's and, a plague um, we have that physicists start in physics and then they sort of colonize other fields. You should make it worse. Yeah, and then uh, Carl Friston was, I think, both incredibly prolific and I... Is he dead? Also, no, no, he's still alive. So uh, he is still incredibly prolific. He's also probably one of the most cited scientists ever. So you, you can you can probably check this uh, right scholar, now. scholar Carl Friston. So, um... Jesus, <laughs> motherfucker! <laughs> What the hell? I mean, he's not the one I'm gonna, gonna want to go on my live stream where we drink and talk about stuff. Uh, so I've actually, I've actually met him, and um, so the, the interesting bit. So Did he have like an aura around him, or like you know, glorious or something? So, so the the free energy principle is actually quite interesting. So the free energy principle is this um, idea of minimizing free energy, which. Once again, I think if you are interested in this, I think Carl Friston has actually written a Wikipedia article on it that might explain this, this much better than you. So it's a bit about... Um, and he he put this forward as, a, I think, a form of intrinsic motivation. So mm -hmm. basically just saying, like, you know, all organisms kind of need to reduce the entropy of their sensor states to kind of... So, so basically the idea, part of the idea is that you know, you need to keep your sensor entropy low, so you're not just, you know, aimlessly 
Mm -hmm. kind of rumblings through the world, but you need to kind of control where you are. And there's Sensor a bit entropy of, low, so basically, that's one part of like the um, curiosity drive, right? And then there's also like there's also a relation to predictive coding that you kind of want to be able to you know tell what your sensory percepts are, and um, so so this connects to a lot of things. So he basically put forward this formula, and I think initially, how, how many lines of Python code? Um, I think there are actually several implementations that are slightly different. I actually get to a punchline there, but um, so one big issue was I think when he put it forward, um, everybody I met, including me, didn't really understand it, mm. right? So, so in our field, this was actually quite at home. For the neuroscientists, for them, it was a lot more into the left field. So he basically proposed this as some kind of underlying mathematical question that governs what the brain optimizes. Mm. And uh, for a lot of neuroscientists, this was, they were like, okay, so this is Carl Friston. Once again, I mean, we looked at his Google Scholar page, so we probably should listen to him. But um, they were also like, I don't get this. So, I mean, I actually met neuroscientists who were like, this is more in your field, can you explain this to me? And I was like, no. I remember we did a, we did a seminar at my university where we read the paper, and it was very difficult. And so what we... I mean, I ended up. But, after but, but if it, no one understands it, maybe it's bullshit. Um, How do you know it's not bullshit? So, so, I mean, things have moved on. I mean, this is like a historical account. So, so I think that some people have gotten a better grip on it, and we've actually um, written a paper recently where we try to uh, kind of compare this one, the free energy principle, and empowerment, predictive regression, a lot of other pitched formalisms for intrinsic motivation mm -hmm. and what we figured out was that it's actually really hard to put them all kind of in the same framework because they all kind of have slightly different assumptions and slightly different mm -hmm. kind of formalisms so and Martin Beale actually a colleague of mine who's now at Araya in Japan did the heavy lifting on this and said oh that's a paper with all the equations yes yes that's a paper with all the equations that I showed you so so he basically <laughs> said hmm I, I think we first need to have a mathematical framework before we do the simulations to compare these things. Mm -hmm. We need to have like a mathematical framework to um, express all of them in. This will take me a weekend. Then it took him six months. And yeah. then we actually wrote a paper about this where we just kind of present this framework with some very, very minimal comparison because already the framework, we only needed two alphabets to express all of these things. Only two alphabets. So uh, I think it's about 40, yeah. 40 symbols or something. And and uh, yeah, I mean, both both the free energy principle and yeah. Markov blanket's pain. Well, of what's the Markov blanket? So the Markov blanket is this kind of idea of how you draw a boundary around something. And we're using it particularly in so one of the big questions that Martin Beale actually worked on during his PhD is figuring out exactly what an agent is. So imagine you're looking at just a bunch of atoms in the universe and or an artificial system. And now you're asking yourself what exactly here is the agent and what exactly is like the other stuff. Mm. And can you somehow, you know, quantitatively define that there's uh, some kind of, you know, integration information measured and some other stuff. But once you kind of nail this down, you then maybe want to talk about like sensors and actuators. And so there's this idea of like drawing kind of a Markov blanket around it. So in a Markov oh. chain, you know how, how like basically yes. a Markov chain or the universe is considered Markovian because like the current state yeah. encodes like all the information that is in the universe going forward. So, so basically, Everything we know about the future that could influence uh, about the past that could influence the future is in the now. Mm -hmm. So, so it's kind yeah. of blocks all of this. In a similar way, you can kind of draw. So, th the actual formism is a bit more complicated because of concerns like parents and stuff. But so the idea is basically to use the, the Markov blanket to kind of define oh, kind I of see. like a boundary yeah. Yeah. of yeah. like you know so be, be, an be, outside and an inside between at the boundary the Markov property holds. Yeah. 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 Right. That's cool. Um, so the thing is, whenever I meet Christoph and talk at some length to him about stuff, he, f he knows more than I do about almost everything. Um, <laughs> that is. No, but I mean, the most, I mean the most everything, almost everything that's within touch, touched by a field, which is pretty, pretty impressive. Um, Thank, you. Thank I, you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, also, I, mean, I, also, I also really, really, I also really feel like I probably butchered the, um, the explanation for the free energy principle. You have to. <laughs> It's actually it's it's one of these things, and I, I 
I do admit that here where every time I look at it, I feel like I kind of get it. And then, you know, once I stop looking at it and go away, I feel like I kind of don't get it anymore. You know, sometimes you talk to people and they explain something to you and you feel like, yeah, yeah, now I understand it. And then you step away and you go like, how how exactly did that work again? It's just like... Yeah, like late Wittgenstein? <laughs> I, I actually never... I only read uh, the Tractatus, never late Wittgenstein. Oh, no, no. Late Wittgenstein is much more... It's much more of a ride, man. It's like much better... Um, early Wittgenstein, sure, it has its sort of serene beauty and it's obviously one. Late Wittgenstein is, is a ride. I mean, it's much... It works better with basically all kinds of drugs. No, I mean, I, and, and, and it's also has much more interesting things to say about the world. Yeah, I mean, at this point, also, I mean, but well, we're already like, I think we're name dropping an incredible amount here. So that's yeah. also that's also a shout out to my um, my other PhD supervisor, Daniel Hatto, who I think for a long time used to be the uh, president of the British Wittgenstein Association, and oh. I think is actually a. Uh, a, a big Wittgensteinian and an activist, oh. and so I think he he did actually I think teach also late Wittgenstein language games and no. uh, all the all the cool stuff. Yeah, and I think was even influenced by him. But um, cool. yeah, and maybe by by osmosis, I probably so so one of the one of the interesting bits is that actually so you know biographical. I, when I did my PhD, I got this interdisciplinary thing where I had like both uh, computer science uh, supervisor yeah. and in the end two philosophy supervisors. Yeah. And uh, sorry. And while I was writing up my PhD, this was really really interesting, but I do not recommend it to anyone out there because it was also so much reading, and then it just doesn't really come together, and you feel like, oh, you know, you, there could really be something good here, yeah. but it's really, really hard then to be productive, and yeah. just kind of get to this level where you just, you know, you try to understand more and more and mm -hmm. more, and as, as we now both have PhD students, I mean, we know reading too much can be a problem, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you, I tell my PhD students that, sure, you should be reading, but like from day one of your PhD, you should also be building something, implement something, get some fucking results, because... Um, despite appearances, um, um, he's doing his weird shit over here. Um, uh, it's good. Thanks, Christoph. Despite appearances, um, a, I'm a very down-to-earth guy that value like concrete results and stuff like this. So, um, what was I? Yeah, yeah. You no, know, no, definitely. I think you you should be you should be building something. Yeah. So so I definitely try to try to get something done, and I found it very very hard to to become productive in philosophy. Yeah. And same. I mean, I, I studied philosophy. I my bachelor's um, thesis in philosophy. I left philosophy because I never felt that I would be able to do something. I mean, and maybe I would come up with the next conception of revolution, but. Very low chance of that, and also like this happens like once every fifty or hundred years or less. So I, um, it, I decided that I needed to um, go to a field that um, suited someone with a more, uh, what do you call it? Some Lack of patience. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Lack of patience. Yeah, so, so, and I, I, no, but what I wanted to say is actually there's a positive message here. So I actually think that doing all this philosophy, uh, doing all this philosophy during my PhD was, was interesting, but I think ultimately difficult or not really productive. But as I, as I grow more and more into like, you know, doing what I do now, mm -hmm. I come back to it more and more often and I appreciate a lot of it and I kind of learn from it and find it like guides me to, this, this sounds very cheesy now, but kind of, you know, find some deeper truths in some of the things that yeah. I do, like, you know, not just, you know, going for the technological solutions, but also kind of, you know, think about the, the stuff it that helps connected you, to it, right? It helps you with the perspective and things, and why what you're doing is important, and also sometimes with, when you ask about the shape of what you're doing, like, you know, if the naive account of, like, um, scientific progress, where, like, you have a hypothesis and then you try to falsify the hypothesis and you corroborate it and as a result you write it up and like very often the shape of the investigation isn't that way. Okay. We do things, we do, we do weird things and it often very helps to very often helps to conceptualize what is the actual um, shape of the contribution to knowledge of the thing we're doing here. Um, 
I'm not saying that everything I do is science, but I try to keep it so that what I do contributes to some kind of knowledge somewhere. So, well, I'm so, just so gonna, I, I think you should do a commercial break as I'm just very, very briefly popping to your, as we call it in Britain, the loo. Oversharing. Clearly <laughs> oversharing. So, um, so I studied um, philosophy for my um, bachelor's degree, philosophy and psychology, and I was interested in um, how to understand consciousness how to understand intelligence, um, and my, um, my my main sort of intellectual um, uh, my main sort of intellectual sort of influence back then was David Chalmers, who lives up here, um, right above me, um, on the, um, uh, in in the building I live, um, <clears throat> and uh, I hope I get him to sort of join the stream at some point, if I stream again, I don't know what the feedback is going to be, but. I was thinking about like the hard question of consciousness and how could we create consciousness in a machine or how could we tell whether a machine or a biological system was indeed conscious in the sense of phenomenal consciousness. Um, and I try to relate this to um, the ancient traditions of, um, or the ancient questions of other minds. And I realized that I don't know how to move this further. I don't know, it, it seems impossible to know. Uh, and that's simply what I didn't want to spend my life sort of, you know, um, sort of slamming my head against a conceptual boundary that I couldn't really control. So that's when I gradually moved into computer science in order to um, understand this better. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and when I moved into computer science, the question was, could we do artificial intelligence bottom up, start with trying to understand or rep understand by replicating very, very simple things. And this in turn led me into games after sort of a, a detour via robotics. So I, um, I, I, I wanted to understand um, the mind by trying to replicate simple minds in robots and then because robots were boring and slow, I wanted to replicate them in games. So this is the interesting thing with Christoph, um, who was working with me in New York for two years, um, was that I um, tried to, um, wow, I see that he just reshared this thing with um, from his Twitter. So I guess Christoph is now on my in my bathroom watching this live stream. This feels a bit unfair somehow. Um, I'm not saying that I would want to be in my bathroom, but still. <clears throat> is that we have a similar background. He also um, went into games research early on, and then he sort of um, um, uh, combined this with artificial life. So, Christoph, before we need to finish this, because I'm getting too drunk, and... Oh, I thought that was the point, sorry. I've actually engaged in a costume change. Yeah, you, <laughs> you undressed. Well, yes. Yeah. This is the uh, stream where we undress. Maybe that's not a good tagline for the future. Uh, I was actually Nothing following else. what you were saying. Modern technology, I tell you, I can just you know carry my cell phone anywhere and uh, listen to this. It's this amazing. is scary. This is scary. Um, yeah. So, uh, do you, before we finish, do you have any kind of like you know yeah, so, so wish I'm, list in terms of guests? No, no, no. We get to that. Um, we can, we, um, uh, I, I want to once more return to the original question and try to um, get a straight answer out of uh, Herr Dr. Salke. Okay. Um, you're not Dr. Professor yet. No. No, just Dr. Salke. Um, and then I want to sign this book, and then I want to sort of finish by saying that, hey, we should, we should come join the podcast. But this is a podcast. What's a podcast? I think a podcast is a thing where you just talk and there's no video. Oh, fuck, this sounds disgusting. Um, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't listen to this. I wouldn't watch this either. But um, anyway, um, so getting back to the original question. Every time I say getting back to the original question, we launch off in a new direction. I'm, I'm very sorry. I'm, it's, I'm very sorry. It's the alcohol, Julian. Yes, that's like <laughs> getting back to the original question, Mr. Alcohol. Um, why? How could we best? Without like going the whole route where we had to reinvent the cell and sort of, you know, recreate biology and do crazy stuff. How could we easiest 
integrate the learnings from biological inspired intelligence into game AI research. You have to, like not too many sentences to answer this. Sorry to put you in the spot. So no, sorry. I think some of the stuff we said is an answer to this. Um, That's better formulations of what drives us to do stuff in the yeah. first place, like the principles that make us act. Yeah. Also, worth investigating. Um, you mentioned the free lunch theorem, right? Yeah. And Games are not a random subset of all possible problems in terms of AI. They're a very specific subset. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, they somehow reflect either, you know, things that motivate us or, you know, things that are kind of our models about the real world. So there are already kind of a, a playground that we build very specifically to both capture salient details about the world mm -hmm. and salient details of uh, what we want. So by basically understanding how, you know, how to kind of, you know, motivate agents to do stuff um, by themselves. And also maybe, I think, uh, world modeling and forward modeling. Shout also, out to David Ha. It's, uh, it's, I think it's also a really important bit. But here again, I think the, the inactivist ideas we discussed, uh, I mean, have a, a certain sympathy. And let's not get into the actual connection, but... I think there is a question of what do we actually model about the future? Like, what is relevant here? What mm -hmm. kind of salient details do we need to kind of, you know, figure out about the future? And how do we figure out what these things are? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, am I, you know... So there are these kind of questions like, you know, do I need to understand how the tiger that is jumping at me is going to fly? Or do I need to understand, like, you know, how the uh, solar spots on the sun are going to evolve in the next, like, three or four minutes? And some well, of them might has be more immediate surveillance value, yes. Yeah, yeah. and, and it's, it's not just this. I think there's a whole way of kind of figuring out how we kind of abstract the world. And games do that, right? So we play a certain game, and it's about the economy, or it's about running, or it's about this and that. And we say, like, look, here's, like, you know, the kind of three stats mm -hmm. you need to kind of capture, and everything is just, uh, you know, window dressing. Yeah. And so... Um, I think that's also my answer why, you know, games are a good avenue to look at these yeah. things. And uh, it's also my answer to how to tackle games. I think, uh, you know, forward models that if we're going to talk about some of the other game AI stuff, right? Like, you know, how to use AI to make stuff for games, right? Mm -hmm. Then we have to flip the whole thing around and, you know, talk about better evaluation metrics. Because mm -hmm. I think, well, we have a lot of stuff that... Mm -hmm. makes games or passable rules for games mm -hmm. so we have grammars to express games when you really know they're successful and when you really know they're like good games and I mean playability as a measure is good mm -hmm. but not sufficient yeah. so um, yeah so I think uh, there's like more stuff to be done there to kind of you know extend this whole idea of you know this kind of you know motivation based metrics embodied metrics um, yeah. So I think that that's a, an interesting um, direction to also push in. You run out of sentences. Good thing we have video. Good thing we have video. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. No, I think I, I think that's true. Um, I want to finish this now because um, Christoph is drunk. I'm drunk. I present that uh, accusation. Yes. I um, um, I want to I want to sign this book. Yes, and uh, I have actually prepared for this. Christoph always prepares. This is uh, Playing Smart by uh, Julian Pedelius, um, great guy. Um, uh, it's his sort of popular scientific sort of um, um, account of the sort of research he does. Um, wait, wait, you are now talking about yourself in the third sort of person. Who would never do that? I mean, not even Julian Tegelius would do that. Who is this Julian Tegelius? It smells nice. It's straight from the press, MIT Press. They like, I don't know what the press is. Okay. Um, to Christoph. With. Can't write. Maybe Oops. I should not have uh, gotten of you to sign this when you are drunk. So my thing, um, artificial. Jesus, artificial.
artificial life and game AI. Um, cheers, Julian. Um, it's great. There you go. Thank you. So, um, actually, I think you know I'm gonna fly back to Europe tomorrow. So maybe I'm just gonna put this in my bag and read it. Yeah. I. Uh, I'm sorry. No, but it's <laughs> it's actually it's okay. It has like pieces about my mom and my cats and so on. Um, and I see things coming up here, but I don't think these are replies to our podcast. Also, you should join the generative design in Minecraft competition, which is uh, um, technically we're both coordinating it, but basically Christoph is running it, and I'm trying to come up with useful ideas. Um, and two other students in my lab also helping out a lot. Mike Green and uh, Julie Cannon. Yeah. So just to pitch this, um, so the. AI settlement generation competition in Minecraft is about building an algorithm that can create an interesting settlement for a given Minecraft map. Mm -hmm. So you write the algorithm, send it to us during the submission deadline, we apply it to the map, see what it builds, and then that um, resulting settlement is evaluated by a bunch of like experts, architects, game designers, mm -hmm. mod makers, and the like. And uh, I mean, we haven't really talked about that much, but I think it is actually a really, really cool um, area of like artificial intelligence that's often mm -hmm. understudied, this idea of computational creativity, and particularly yeah. of adaptive computational yeah. creativity, or as I think Max Kraminski recently called it, like, you know, reading what's already out there for your PCG and, generator. And, and, and creating content in response to yeah, it. Yeah, and, and I think that's, that's something humans can do and intuitively do well. Okay. And we're not, I don't think we're really good at AIs uh, doing that currently. Yeah. So, so yeah, um, I think um, this will be, you know, it's a great challenge and um, we'll hopefully have some cool news about uh, some developments there. So yeah. um, follow follow the other Twitter account for that. It's, I think, Gen Design MC um, if you want to get updates on that. Yeah. But I mean, my question was like, you know, going forward, given that this is the inaugural episode, I mean, who who are your wish lists of guests, Jordan? Yeah, so I hope to do this again, AI and drinks, because I like talking about AI and drinking. And uh, who's my list of guests? I don't know. I mean, generally, this is open for people. Come here, and if you know something, and you know, you're in the area. Um, and I live in Greenwich Village in New York City. This is my bedroom. Um, uh, come over and we have a chat. And I mean, I'll get you drinks. Um, are you are you going to talk uh, your next guest into this? Yeah, I think Alessandra Canossa at Danish Design School and um, also at um, Ubisoft Massive, um, a sort of game developer. He, I'll probably get him to join this. Um, I mean, he's staying at my place, he's coming for Tiago Machado's PhD defense in two weeks, so um, I'm pretty sure I can force him into this. Um, so, but, you know, I'm open for other guests. Um, if you have something interesting to say about artificial intelligence, if you agree with what I say, um, and if, or if you disagree with what, you, with what I say, I think we can have a useful sort of, you know, um, conversation about things. Oh, you know, I mean, of course, you have the obvious um, options here, right? I mean, maybe, you know, you could get one of the um, AI specialists from NYU. Yeah, we have lots of great um, uh, AI researchers at NYU. I don't want to be naming names, but, um, I mean, look, Kung Yun Sho lives across the... Um, the um, um, lives across the courtyard. Maybe you should come over. Or, or you know, maybe your upstairs neighbor. Oh, David Chalmers. Yeah, <laughs> come over if you see this. A young come, come over. He lives a few blocks away. Fair enough. Good. Okay, over and out. We're gonna can keep con continue drinking without you because you know you watching us make us so damn self conscious. Okay. And uh, it's great if you made it this far in the stream. All three of you, great job. Um, cheers. Um, uh, yes to you. Cheers. Thanks for joining the show, Christoph. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's been an honor. <laughs>